Hello friends, my name is Alex Grekis and I want to welcome you to the Finding Lost Civilization series. Now the purpose of this series is to visit ancient sites that time has long forgotten. Presently I'm trekking near the village of Brome, located in eastern townships in a province of Quebec, Canada. I'll tell you today's journey is going to be very interesting because I've made some fascinating discoveries that I want to share with you. And so I invite you to come trek with me. I know today is going to be a wonderful day. One of the things I want to show you, friends, is the circular pattern of this mound we're on. Now, it's a little difficult because it's somewhat deconstructed, but let's start right over here. If you follow my finger, right over here, you can see the circular arc. Uh, right over here, you can see the foundation right over here. Okay, and over here, it's there's a fall over here where it uh, caved in. But if you keep following my finger right here, you'll see the outline of the circular pattern. What I'll do is I'll come up a little closer here and right there it uh, continues in a circular pattern right over here and there again you can see some big foundation stones over there okay you can see them right here and there it continues right here. Uh, let me get closer and from that stone right here right before it is the circular pattern and look right over there, you can see part of the layered structure over here, right up against the tree, and back around. So you can see there's a circular pattern to this mound. Now, another interesting aspect of this mound is look right here at the center top over here. What we have is a piece of quartz. A piece of quartz, a low-grade quartz, but uh, there you have it right on the center of the mound. Again, we'll come back here and you can see over here the circular pattern. Well, as I was scanning the woods, I saw another mound directly in front of us. There, there you go. So let's take a look at it. Uh, my goodness, it's really a beautiful uh, piece of work. And right from here, I can tell that it's circular in nature. Can you tell that from here? And this one over here, uh, the construction seems to be um, uh, not as uh, degraded as the last one that we've seen. You can clearly see right over there the layered stone. You can clearly see the circle. What I'm going to do is approach it slowly over here so we can get a really nice perspective. Again, you can see the layering of the stone. And look, right there is a, a capstone right there. So let me go to the left of this uh, beautiful stone circle. Look at this. This is really magnificent. And uh, again, look at the layering right over here. My goodness, this is really beautiful. What I'm going to do is go down here to ground level to give you an idea of the structure. So this one is very distinct. The other one we saw seemed to be uh, somewhat deconstructed. Uh, of course, if these are very old, it would be in a natural state, so to speak, of uh, deconstruction. Maybe the loggers in this area deconstructed it. People came along, stood on the 
uh, walls of the stone circle and uh, collapsed it, but this one is well, well, very well preserved. Now there are many of these mounds in what's called the Eastern Township, and apparently people say they are historic in nature. They say that the farmers built these mounds, or that the local natives, the Abenaki Indians, built these mounds. But you know, this is not a known behavior of settlers, farmers, and or the local natives here to build circular mounds with a quartz capstone. Well, as I was scanning the woods, I noticed another very large mound. There it is directly in front of us. Can you see it? Now that mound appears to be three times larger than the one we just came from. I'll tell you, it's fairly large. Its uh, height looks, uh, I'd say, five to six feet, but uh, let me bring the camera in closer. And uh, right from here, I can discern a layering of stone. In other words, let's call it a rock wall to the side of that pile. Can you see that? It definitely looks layered. It's not a jumble or a pile of rocks, although it does look like that initially. Uh, anyways, let's work our way uh, to that uh, mound. Well, this is going to be exciting. This mound uh, definitely does have some features on it uh, that uh, are very discernible. Uh, first off, I can tell it's, it's tall. It's at least six feet tall. And look at over here to the sides as I'm approaching. Uh, this is very exciting because, again, uh, you can see the layering of stone. In other words, it was placed there by humans. Okay, let's, let's get real close. Very distinctive. I can also tell that it's been somewhat deconstructed. In other words, I can see right over here there's been rock falls. But again, this is quite, quite normal. So, let's go look over here. This is really fabulous. What I'm going to do is I'm going down here at ground level. Again, <laughs> this is not just a jumble of rocks thrown together. This was definitely layered. And uh, this one appears to be more, um, I'll call it egg-shaped, almost rectangular. Uh, look at this here. You can see there's a rock fall right over here. And as I'm walking along, you can see a rock fall over here. Now, it's hard to say, did uh, time do this or did people walk on these and uh, deconstruct them? Uh, again, there's the top uh, right over there. Here's the sides. So I'll go slowly around. And again, I can see what I'll call a rock fall over here. What I'm going to do is, is walk around and look at this uh, giant quartz piece. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the capstone. The reason I say this as I'm looking at this uh, quartz stone over here, if I put a trajectory to it right over there, right up there, that's the center piece right there. And actually you can, you can see the, the rock fall right over here. You can see the rock fall coming down this way to where the stone is. Also, if you look over here, you can see there's been a rock fall over here. And uh, there you can see part of the layering. Uh, so it's hard to say what happened here, but uh, probably some human interaction after this was built caused this rock fall. Again, there's this large quartz piece, which I suspect could have been the capstone. Well, let's get to the top over here. Uh, okay, again, uh, this is really <laughs> fascinating. Okay, here I am. I'm at the top of this um, stone. I won't call it a circle. This is more, as I said, egg-shaped, rectangular-shaped, but uh, there's the quartz piece that uh, I saw. And you can actually see, look, right over here, take a look at this. Right over here, I can see where there was a large stone here. And again, if you follow this here, my finger, that's, that's, there it is, there's the quartz piece. So someone could have come here and thrown it off, uh, created a rock fall. Uh, you know, this has been here for many years, so I'm certain that I'm not the first person on this uh, rock, Karen. Well, this is another view of the mound. And it's about uh, 21 feet across and about uh, 18 to 15 feet uh, wide. So it's a fairly large mound. 
Uh, it's not exactly rectangular. It, it looks like I'll call it an egg shaped, uh, not a circular pattern. But uh, here's the view from over here. And uh, what I'm going to do is walk around this mound to give you an idea of what it looks like. And uh, you know, the question is is this a, a cairn? In other words, is this a burial mound? We don't know. We don't know. Um, these mounds remain an enigma in this area. Uh, archaeologists today, uh, generally speaking, ascribe these mounds to uh, settlers and or possibly to the natives. They don't ascribe anything prehistoric to these mounds. Uh, but, <laughs> that's the big question, were these mounds here before the settlers? Now there's some people that believe these mounds were built by Europeans, people from Europe, before the discovery of America by Columbus, before 1492. So, we have a mystery here, we have a question, we have a mound that has no explanation, no answers uh, to date, and they remain an enigma. Well, friends, let me tell you my story of how I became interested in these Karens. About five years ago, in the year 2013, I visited a small country museum in a village of Knowlton, located in the eastern townships, province of Quebec in Canada. While inside this museum, I saw a photograph that was titled Indian Rock. And when I closely looked at this photograph, I saw that there were petroglyphs on this boulder. There were a series of slash and hash marks. And then I was amazed to see the caption further went on to say that a local resident had translated these hash and slash marks as a story of Indians raiding a place in Lake Champlain. Well, I thought to myself, that seemed to be somewhat of a stretch of imagination as I was not aware that the natives here, the local natives, had an alphabet or a writing system, let alone when I looked at this boulder that didn't seem to make any sense. And so when uh, I asked the curator if she could provide me additional information, I was directed to Mr. Gerard Leduc. And so I contacted him and asked him about this Indian boulder. Surprisingly, he told me when he took a look at the writings and he examined them on this boulder, these petroglyphs, he concluded that they were Ogham writing. Now, Ogham writing is known as Old Irish or Ancient Irish language. And it first came into use about the first century AD through, I think, to about 16 AD. Well, the implications of what Mr. Leduc had said was that possibly Celtic people had arrived here in North America prior to the arrival of any European settlers. Mr. Leduc went on to further explain that there were many circular stone mounds located in this area. He said that these mounds were circular in nature and that the capstone or the center top stone of these mounds usually contain a quartz crystal or quartz stone. In an effort to ascertain who constructed these stone mounds, Mr. Leduc and a French archaeologist excavated two of them. What they found essentially at the bottom of each cairn were the remains of a fire pit. Now testing of the charcoal, the remains of the fire pit yielded three separate dates, with the oldest being 1850 before present. And so you can see that this date predates the arrival of any European settling here into North America. However, their finding did not answer the question as to who actually constructed these mounds. And so to this day, they remain a mystery. Hello, friends. Well, it's going to be a wonderful day today. I'm here in the town of Knowlton, and specifically, I'm in the Brome County Historical Society Museum. I'll tell you what, it's going to be fantastic. I love these small town museums because you can be with the objects, you can feel part of the history much closer than you can in these large museums in the big cities. Now those museums are wonderful, but here at this small museum, we will be able to see, feel, and touch the objects, the, our history. And I'll tell you what, that's a fantastic feeling. Friends, let me show you this interesting item over here. When I was a child growing up and watching movies, I remember them referring to wampum. <laughs> wampum was some 
type of trade item, but here it is. This is what a wampum is. This was used as legal tender by the natives and the British colonists. Another thing about the wampum is that it could be worn as a belt. So this wampum, this legal tenor, this money was worn as a belt. Here you go, these are the strings that tie around the waist. But all this over here was considered as money. It could be exchanged for furs, food, and many other items. This is really a beautiful piece of history before us. Here's another fantastic thing. Look at this here, an Indian peace pipe. Look at this, made out of soapstone. I'll tell you, it's smooth and beautiful. Really fascinating a piece of artwork. So there we have it. I tell you, I love coming to these museums because you and I are able to see, feel, and touch the objects of the past that normally are unavailable to us. Well, here's another interesting object. Look at this. This, look, you can actually see bark. This is the bark from a tree. Let's see what it says. Indian bracelet made of sweet grass and porcupine quills. So there you have it. There's your porcupine quill. Really fascinating. Oh my goodness, look at this. Although this is historic, this fish hook, this copper fish hook, was probably traded by the colonists to the natives of this area. Friends, let me show you another interesting tool. Look at this over here. When I first looked at it, I said, what is this? What is this? Now, you have to remember, we're in an area here in Canada where the canoe <laughs> was used by the native populations for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so when I looked at this object over here, I noticed that it was very, very sharp over here. And as I held it in my hand, I came to realize that this tool is no different than the chisel that we use today that's made out of metal. So this was used to gouge the lumber. This was used to gouge the log to make the canoe or strip the bark from the tree. I'll tell you, this is a fantastic tool. It could be hundreds, if not thousands of years old. Even though this is made from stone, some things still maintain their, I guess, utility because today you can find the same type of tool made out of metal. Its utility has lasted man for thousands of years. Well, friends, let me show you some other interesting objects. These here are historic objects. At the time, that the settlers arrived here to North America. The ancients that lived in this area, generally speaking, did not have access to metal. They didn't know how to work with metal. But as the settlers came here, they started trading with the Indians. And this item is a prehistoric item used to trade with the Indians. This is a metal ax. And I tell you what, this was really an advancement in what we would say armory here, going from stone to metal i tell you, this really must have been something fantastic to the natives that lived in this area when they first encountered these type of objects that were traded to them. As you can see over here is a branch. I don't know what kind of tree this came from, but there you go. You can see how it's fitted here into this tomahawk. It's a beautiful piece. It really is. Here's another one, a little simpler, but just as deadly, I guess, used in warfare and or, I guess, agriculture. But these items, as I said, are historic and probably date back to the time that the settlers arrived here. Well, friends, let me show you this item right here. This is a photograph, and this is what started our journey over here. This photograph depicts what's called the Indian Rock. Well, there's a little bit of debate today as to whether it's actually of Indian origin or ancient Celtic. So this is really fascinating. This is the photograph that started our journey, our curiosity to see what's happening in this local region. So my name is Gérard Leduc. I live here in Potton Township, which is a territory designed by the British after the uh, American Revolution. When I first came here, I told people I was interested in archaeology. And they said, oh, well, we have what we, uh, the Indian rock of Poppin. And I said, well, I'm interested. So I went to see <clears throat> and took pictures and uh, 
a lot of people have been looking at it before me, some people from the United States, <clears throat> and uh, after a while comparing ancient script from manuscripts and comparing to the uh, engraved markings on the so-called Indian rod, I realized it was not Indian. And besides, there was an archaeologist from the Quebec government uh, wrote a report, which I have a copy. He said it's not it's not Amerindian. It's, it's some kind of Euro-American. That is, it's in America, but from European origin. And then I went further, and then uh, with the um, got hold of a copy of a manuscript called the Book of the Ballymote that was uh, written by monks in Ireland around 1390. And what is interesting about this manuscript is it, it, it's, right, it's written in parallel. Ogham, which is the script of the Celts, and Gaelic. Now, Gaelic are it's a modern language. So this way you're able to, uh, to identify the individual letters on the, on the basis of the Book of the Ballymore. <clears throat> And I was able to identify at least one word on this what's so-called Indian rock. Uh, so I have the word Leah, and Leah means a stream. It's not an easy task to convince our public that they were people here other than Columbus uh, in 1492, because it's uh, ingrained in our knowledge, ingrained in our school books, that the first European to set foot in America was Christopher Columbus. Uh, for example, in, in this area of Potton, uh, we have the evidence of an ancient Celtic presence. And that's, in, that's in not only in Potton, but in many other places in Quebec that I have been identified Celtic script. an archaeologist from France who had a lot of experience with cairns. Now, we're talking about here cairns, I and mean, they're not stone pile or stone mounds, they're cairns. That is a, a stone monument. And so we have st carefully studied two of them, just dismantling them stone by stone and level by level, taking pictures. And finally we found at the bottom a, a mass of charcoal that was buried about uh, 10 centimeters below the ground level. And so we have two carbon, radiocarbon dates at that place. One is 1,800 years ago, the other one is 1,500 years ago. We're here because I wanted to show you this ancient boundary wall over here. Now this is what the settlers did when they arrived here into the New World. As they found rocks and land that they were going to cultivate, they set up these uh, boundary lines, okay? This is their border area. And so this was the pattern or the manner in which the early settlers used loose stone that they found in fields that they were going to cultivate. Aside from these boundary lines, these property lines, they also used the stone for corrals, pens, chimneys in their houses, and foundations. 
they didn't make rock circles, rock mounds, cairns, or dolmens. It just wasn't a practice of the early settlers that we are aware of. So you can see the boundary line goes way up there. Now, in many historical accounts, the settlers make reference to the fact that these mounds that we've seen were here prior to their arrival. So again, the question is, who placed those mounds there? How old are they? And as I said, they continue to remain uh, somewhat of an enigma. Well, after filming the sequences we've just seen, I went back to speak with Mr. Leduc. I was somewhat surprised when he told me that he believed many of these stone walls that we see here in eastern townships existed prior to the arrival of settlers. He went on to say that his observation is that many of these rock walls have no relationship whatsoever to any boundary line or a field that may have existed at one time. And so I went out and explored again on my own, and I was able to confirm that many rock walls that I encountered did not have any relationship whatsoever to some sort of property lines. And so they remain an enigma, just like the stone mounds, who built them, how long have they been here, what was their purpose, and what happened to the culture that did build them. friends, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself trekking here in the Eastern Townships, province of Quebec, Canada. Now the purpose of this series is to visit ancient sites that time has long forgotten and to open a portal in our minds to seek further knowledge. And I hope our trek today has done that. It's still a great mystery. Who built these stone circles? Who built these mysterious rock alignments? Was it the settlers? Was it the natives? Or some unknown culture? Well, the mystery is what makes all this so exciting. And so I invite you to continue trekking with me as we go seek further knowledge. Mm -hmm.